as long as, what's the rules for like Olympic speed walking, right? You have to have one foot both feet on the ground, right? Yeah, heel toe, heel toe. Oh. Please don't remind me. Okay. Alright. Alright. Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so, last week, we covered Christ came to fulfill the law. Uh, and now, we're going to have a list of different applications of how Christ fulfilled the law, and how Christ uh, upholds the law, and how we, in Christ, also uh, strive to uphold the law uh, in the kingdom of God. And so, uh, there is our list of topics. And again, I recognize that uh, these uh, teachings of Jesus are very profound and uh, somewhat disputed uh, in and outside the inside and outside the Christian church, which makes it even more difficult uh, and will probably slow us down a little bit, but that's okay. That's a good thing. Uh, and so I recognize that you know this list will probably take us two or three weeks. So I'm totally okay with that. All right? So here we go. Actually, let's begin with the word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you come to bring your kingdom here on earth. And we ask that you would continue to send the Holy Spirit richly upon us, that we may believe your word and lead godly lives here in time and there in eternity. Bless this Bible study that we may understand our role as citizens of your heavenly kingdom here on earth. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Anger. So this will be Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 26. Okay, so I just want to give a, a real overview. Oh, my computer is really touchy this today. Okay, so how Jesus organizes his teaching. He's going to have an opening contrast, uh, and this pattern will be repeated uh, pretty regularly uh, throughout these teachings, okay? So, uh, you have heard, but I say to you, and then there'll be uh, a, a further expounding upon or sometimes using illustrations to make his point of what I am teaching you, okay? So that's just, in general, every topic, almost every topic is kind of addressed in this way, all right? So, uh, let's take a look and actually, let's just read the whole thing just to get the whole picture. Uh, so could someone read Matthew 5, verses 21 to 26? You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he, will, he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last time. All right, this is where the Lord Amen. 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 to God. Okay, so hopefully you kind of see the outline uh, as uh, Brett was reading, right? You know, the outline of how Jesus is presenting this, okay? So, the opening contrast, okay? All right, so verses 21 and 22, all right? You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with this brother will be liable to judgment, Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. All right. So what's the difference between 
what you've heard of old and what Jesus says. What's the difference? Yeah. It's a lot harder to do. It's a lot easier to be what Jesus says. My thoughts count. My, my words. desires count. My words count. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jesus contrasts like, don't murder people, right? Oh, easily good. Done. Yeah. Well, for most people, that is easily done. Right? You know, uh, uh, do I have to have everyone close their eyes and put their heads down and say, if anyone has murdered someone, please raise your hand now? No, I'm not going to do that. Right? But, you know, most of us will probably pass that test. Right? But, how many of you have ever been frustrated to the point that you've actually name called someone a very not nice thing? Yeah. Yeah, 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 put your heads down. <laughs> all right. We all do, right? What Jesus says is a lot harder to keep. It's more than just the crass deed, right? Um, I'm going to get to this in a little while, but I really do believe that Jesus is the best teacher when it comes to the commandments. Well, he's God, <laughs> right? But he gets to the heart. He gets to the heart of the matter, right? Not just the crass D, not the, the biggest example of the crass D, but the true intent of God's will for us and our life in him. Our life under him, but especially our life in him, in his kingdom. Okay? And so, yeah, it's hard. Or maybe it's more specific. Maybe it's the whole picture. Right? The whole picture. Right? Um, how is today's general attitude, worldly or religious teaching, similar to verse 21? Do people today kind of just say, I haven't killed anyone, I've kept the commandment? Is that a prevalent attitude today? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And even if you have, I have a valid excuse. Oh boy. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Right? Yeah, there, there, you know, a lot of times we boil this down to the crassest wit, right? Because, well, I don't know why. Why, why do you think that is? Why do, we boil, why do some people, either by their religious or not, boil it down to the crassest thing? Again. Makes it easier for us to say, well, I have another bathroom. Okay, it makes it a, a lot easier to say, I have kept the law. Right? If you keep that standard as low as possible, pray to say, I have kept the law. Yeah. So there must be an innate need to be right. And there to is. not be in trouble all the time with God or other people and Absolutely. justify yourself. Right? Deep down inside, we want to be right. You know, deep down inside, we all have that inkling in us that we want to be right. We want to be right with God, and we want to be right just in general. Right? That's a good thing. The danger, though, right, is when we loosen the law of God in order to justify ourselves, right, or declare ourselves right, or to make us seem like we're right, right? And, and, and so, uh, yeah, it's... Or to convince everybody else. Or convince everyone else that we're right. Yeah, yeah. We also want to have our way. Lowering the bar allows us to have both our way and still believe that we are following God's law. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That if we keep that bar low so that we can keep it, right? Then, yeah, we, we can be right in our own way and say that the claim that we're following God. Yeah. It's also, it's the at least I have not done this defense. So it's like, yeah. Um, it's easier to compare yourself to other men, less, you know, or more sinful men, than it is to compare yourself to God's law. Yeah, and that actually became a problem with the scribes and Pharisees and other righteous folk. Thank God righteous God folk, like right? You know, is that, here's the goal. Like, uh, Jesus actually calls us out, I don't think it's in Matthew, but he basically says, you keep that standard high, high enough that you still think you keep it, but above what everybody else can achieve so that you can declare yourself righteous and everybody else unrighteous. Uh, you hypocrites, right? And it goes on. But, you know, there is that 
attitude and practice, whether it's religious or non-religious, right? So what is God? Yeah, go ahead. So I was going to say, I think also there's a difference between like religious and non-religious that um, there, among the non-religious, there's more of a separation between like whatever goes on in here and out there. Right. They have this continue like wanting to always separate them. They have nothing to do with each other. Right, right. Yeah, it's only external, not not addressing the internal, right? And you notice how Jesus, like, addresses the internal, right? Those of you who are in early service today, the gospel reading for today tells us, like, the internally what's wrong, right? The, the world as a whole, especially non-religious, does not really address that. It can't. It doesn't. Yeah. Well, I think also a lot of that is the internal can't be addressed by human laws. Yeah. You can't quantify it, right? It's kind of like, as I mentioned the sermon, right? There is a level here that is not flesh and blood, right? There is something spiritual, intangible, unquantifiable, unlawable that you can't pin it down, right? And the, the, the nature of worldly teaching, right, addresses the external act, right? Which is good to help maintain order in the world, but to maintain righteousness or to give or, you know, procure righteousness, no. It doesn't work. Well, isn't the simplest form of idolatry to put yourself before God? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So, here we go. Uh, we got the opening contrast. A little bit more. All right. So, focusing on Jesus' words, especially in verse 22. What's significant about the phrase, his brother? Okay, so Jesus says, I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. What does that imply? We're in the same grouping, also known. Give me the F word. Family. Family, right? That F word, right? Family tribe, right? Yeah, anything to add? I was just going to say, I. Oh, Cain and Abel, right? Am I my brother's keeper? Right? When God says, hey, where's your brother? Right? And, and Cain, in his heart, uh, murdered his brother even before he actually physically murdered his brother. And then afterwards, still had that smug attitude toward God. Am I my brother's keeper? Right? What would Jesus say about that attitude? <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. Your brother. Your brother, your family, you share flesh and blood, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or if you consider, uh, uh, you know, verse 9 in Matthew chapter 5, or maybe even the first words of the Lord's Prayer. What else does his brother imply? Our Father, who art in heaven, or uh, Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Alright? Is it just human being to human being? What other relationship could this be hinting at? The family of God. Right? Also known as the church. Right? The communion of saints. Right? You know, that there is a brotherhood, sisterhood, right? You know, that as the dear children of God, right? As members of Christ's kingdom, we are each other's brother and sister. Right? Because we have the same father. God. Right? And should we ever forget that? No, we should never forget that, right? We should never, ever forget that, right? And then Jesus expounds more, right? Um, whoever insults his brother. So what does it mean to insult his brother? Uh, in the Greek, it says, uh, say raka to. How many of your Bibles actually say, say raka to? Uh, in verse uh, 20, is it 22? For, yeah, verse 22. Right? So some translations will say, say raka to, or sometimes they'll say, insults, 
his brother. Uh, that is a term of abuse or a term of put down relating to a lack of intelligence. And the best example that is uh, kind of godly enough to say in this group is numbskull. Okay, bonehead, bonehead, right? Um, that's kind of the, the level of put down uh, that they're thinking. Or maybe calling them a, a very unwise donkey. Uh, maybe that would probably be the uh, fullest manifestation of that word, right? Inappropriate name calling that is not fitting for brothers and sisters in Christ who pray to our Father who art in heaven, right? Our Heavenly Father says, you know, just like, I mean, how many of you have ever called out your kids on name calling to one another? How many of you permit it? How many of you permit name and encourage name calling uh, amongst your children to each other? Okay, uh, okay, but should you? No. Right. Is that fitting for the body of Christ? Is that a, that's a yes or no question. No, it's not fitting, right? It's not fitting, right? Uh, okay, and then it says, whoever says, you fool, right, will be liable to the hell of fire. Uh, the Greek word for that is where we get the word moron. Okay? Uh, and, actually, the Bible speaks about a fool uh, in the Psalms multiple times. Psalm 14, for example. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Right? You know that if we are dealing with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're angry at a brother or sister in Christ, Benjamin. should we call them godless heathens? No. We are not calling our brothers and sisters in Christ godless heathens. Right? So that's kind of the feel that Jesus is explaining here. Any questions on that? And then we'll get the expounding illustration here in just a minute. Yeah. Does the same thing apply to non-Christians? Ooh. Not yeah. Ooh. Mm. Does the same thing apply to non-Christians? Yes and no. I mean, there are times where we do need to... I mean, I think the Catechism has a good explanation. I think it's in the... Uh, second petition of the Lord's Prayer, or first petition, right? You know, that we should patiently address, especially within the body of Christ, we should patiently address wrongdoing, you know, and, and correcting error, giving guidance, giving counsel, you know, pointing out error, right? You know, that we should patiently do so. But for those who persist in their errors, Right? There does become a, I can't deal, I'm not going to deal with you anymore. Right? But you still have to name call. I would say no. Yeah. I think you need to call that back. Yeah. This is this verse that Christ prohibits name calling. So you don't, you know, go to an atheist or something and say, you fools! You actually talk to anyone. Right. Yeah. Give a reason for the hope that is in you, you do it with gentleness and respect. Right? Now, if someone persists in their error and is constantly against God and against you because you follow God, there may come a time where you have to say, look, no, I, I, I cannot deal with you. Right? I, I'm, I'm, but are you still going to pray for them? You're going to pray for a change of heart because you're a Christian. Because Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the sons of God. You are in the household of God, right? You are citizens of this heavenly kingdom. It is your honor, privilege, and blessing to advocate for peace with God, right? And to bring people to the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Some will listen, some won't, right? But we're still going to advocate, right? We're still going to advocate, yeah. And I, I have relationships with people that I wouldn't call fools, but they definitely are on a completely different page, and, and it, it takes a lot of effort to communicate in ways that keep the door open. Right. Without feeling you've been disloyal to God, 
or yeah. affirm them in wrong thinking. Yeah. And you know, I think there is a point where we can say, hey, this course of action is foolish. You know, this path, this attitude, this practice that I see is foolish. And you ought to reconsider it. Right? I think that's about you know where you want to be. Yeah. A good example of that is all Right. 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 Yeah, good. Good. All right. So let's get to the heart of the matter a little bit more. So there's uh, the first illustration. Uh, actually, the illustration. Yeah, the first illustration is verses 23 to 24. Let's take a look at it one more time. All right. Um, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. So what's the setting for Jesus' illustration here? Before the altar. Before the altar. Where's the altar? Temple. Good. You're trying to get right with God. right? You're focusing on that relationship with God. You're at the altar. What's offered at the altar, by the way? Forgiveness from God. What else? Uh, it mentions a gift, right? It's a sacrifice, right? At the altar, right? One of the goals, that, or one of the duties of God's faithful, right, is to offer sacrifices, right? You provide a lamb, you provide a bull, you provide pigeons, doves, grain, right? All kinds of things, right? And those are given, right? That's the literal offering, right? And that God promises peace, right? God promises uh, that these are well-pleasing in his nostrils as the smoke goes up, right? Um, so that's the setting, all right? So what is Jesus saying, keeping that, you know, what he's already said in verse 22, like, what is he saying? What is he teaching? Yeah. You're trying to get right with God. You're not right with the people that you actually live with, who you are supposed to serve, so that you can serve God. Yeah, we you can't separate that. that. No, you can't together. separate being right with God and right with your family in God, right? The, your brothers and sisters in Christ. It needs to be addressed, right? Yeah, uh, here in this yeah, so, right, awesome. so I think too, it's important to keep in mind who he's talking to here, mm -hmm. because. He is saying it's not enough to be performative, right? You can't just go there and give the sacrifice, even and your heart's in the wrong place, and think everything's hunky dory, right? You have to walk away, right? He's talking to Pharisees and Sadducees in this group here, and he's kind of pointing out that just giving the sacrifice is not enough. Okay. All right. Anything else? Stole my answer. Right. Okay, so here's, I'm going to take a step farther. I don't think he's given it just to Pharisees and Sadducees. Um, a lot of good, faithful Bible commentaries, uh, commentators especially uh, amongst uh, Lutherans, will emphasize that Matthew was written for the worshiping community, the Christian community, okay? The early church, okay? So scribes and Pharisees aside, we no longer make sacrifices at the temple. What would be a comparable situation for Christians today using Jesus' illustration in verses 23 and 24? What are some things that we do even today uh, that you think would kind of be, maybe not apples to apples, but pretty close? Yeah. Taking communion. Taking communion. Right? You know, um, actually, uh, some churches, uh, historically and even to this day, uh, do, what do we call it, the uh, sharing of peace, right? It's not meant to be a howdy-doody kind of thing. The original intent of the passing of the peace was so that this could happen. And that if the peace was ignored by someone, or someone refused to say to their fellow Christian, who they're about to commune with, I can't say peace with you. Full stop. No communion. Right? And maybe, I don't know what they did. Maybe they, like, stopped the whole worship thing and just, like, talked about it and did, like, you know, until it was peaceful. And then they went back to communion. I don't know if they did that. If they had no time, you know, no time constraints, that's a good practice. Right? 
Um, but yeah, like it, it, it was that intentional with the passing of peace originally as it was given, right? And it's kind of morphed into a howdy doody, holy handshake, how you doing, yeah. see the game last night, kind of thing. You know, <laughs> you know and so like, that's not the point, right? All right, anything else that we can glean? Uh, parable situation for Christians today. I think the community is probably the number one answer. <laughs> Dr. Scare uh, from the seminary would agree with you. Okay. Yeah. Passing of the peace, is that the same as peace be with you? Yes, yes. That literally Christians would, before communion, usually during the offering time, would actually say, peace be with you, right? And they would say it to everybody. And if they ignored someone because there was unresolved conflict, that would be a problem. That would be a problem. That needed to be addressed. That's what it was for. Not just to frighten introverts and make <laughs> extroverts <laughs> excited. Not all extroverts like it either, just so you know. Yeah, not. <laughs> because it's morphed into something that it really isn't. That's why. I just said the same story. So then it's easy, right? You just go down the road. You just rotate through. It's easy. All right. Anything else? Uh, any other comparable situations for Christians today? Um, you know, the whole offering, the gift, um, at the altar. So I think we got the number one answer. And the survey said probably like 92. <laughs> right. Uh, all right. So, whose responsibility is it to be reconciled to their brother within the household of God, within the kingdom of God? Yeah, I am. You are. Yeah. The correct answer is, I am. I am. It's my responsibility. And if you don't like the R word, it is my honor. It is my privilege. Right? It is my blessing. Why is it good? Why is it good to address, you know, if someone has something against you uh, and, and seeking reconciliation with them? What's good? So a misunderstanding doesn't fester. Yeah. I mean, we don't want wounds festering. Right? That's a good thing. Wow. Yeah. Whoever sins, you lose honors, will be loosed in heaven. Sin. Oh, so there might be an opportunity for confession and forgiveness, right? You actually get to be a part of loosing sins. That's amazing. That's a, that's a good gift, right? That's a good gift. Yeah, anything else? Yeah. All right, confession, it, uh, well, you know, you used to go to the pastor on Saturday and confess mm -hmm. all your sins, mm -hmm. and he would say, absolutely, you know, it is, uh, I, you are forgiven. to 
not see the sins of other people when you look at them. Jesus offers you the opportunity that your heart doesn't race, that your teeth don't get clenched, and that other people's teeth and hearts don't race and get clenched either. Take them up on it. It's good. Yeah. yeah. Could this be part of bearing your cross? It can be. Because, you know, I mean, when you point out someone's sin or when you try to work through things, right, you know, sometimes they listen. Most sometimes the time they, they don't. don't. Right? But that's not on you. Right? That's on them. Right? But, hopefully, within the body of Christ, you share the same Father. You share the same basis of the Word of God. You can address it. And, you know, with grace. With grace. Yeah. You'll never have personal peace if you don't. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, that is part of bearing the cross. But sometimes we foolishly choose our own crosses. Whereas ours are honor. Right? It's my responsibility, my honor, my gift, my privilege. To be a peacemaker. Because God says, you're blessed. Yeah. It's also a good way to practice the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, justice, self control. I mean, all those deal with anger. <laughs> right? They all deal with anger. Right? It's like the, the positive side of anger. Right? The better side. Where we want to be. And how we address it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. Let, let's uh, hold that thought. We're going to get to that, okay? Uh, because I think it does go both ways, okay? Uh, I don't think it's an exclusion. I don't think it's an either or. Uh, because Jesus has words to say later on in Matthew about the, the situations you mentioned, okay? And that is the responsibility of a brother or sister to uh, address those who sin against them. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so that was the worship illustration. Now we get a court legal situation, verse 25 and 26. All right. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Um, you know, hopefully Christians aren't literally suing each other in court. Uh, Paul speaks against such things in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So, and this is also terrible legal advice. This goes against all legal advice that's given to us. Uh, don't address the person who's suing you, right? So what point is Jesus making? What's the point Jesus is getting? Seek peace. Seek peace, not vengeance. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called... The higher authorities And the higher authorities do not deal with you by grace. <laughs> right? If you are going to rely on worldly means to settle differences, don't expect grace. Okay? Your dirty laundry will be aired in front of everybody. Nothing will be hidden. And it is all by force, right? It is all by force. You have an opportunity to handle things by grace. <laughs> Blessed are the peacemakers. Yeah. Somebody once recently told me, do not let your uh, anger be with you. Oh, yeah, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Your anger don't yes. let the devil have a foothold. Don't. Yeah. Right? Foot over you. Yeah. 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 Blessed are the peacemakers. I think that's the point Jesus is making. And whose responsibility and whose honor is it? Uh, ours. Right? It's ours. All right. The heart of the commandment. So, again, what kind of heart does our Heavenly Father desire in his children? You know, what kind of heart is Jesus promoting in this section? What kind of heart? How would you describe this heart that Jesus is describing, encouraging us to have, based on this paragraph? Forgiving. Forgiving heart. Good. 
contrite heart, right? A humble heart, yeah. right? Humble to admit my own uh, shortcomings. Oh, here it comes. Desiring peace. Desiring peace, right? A peaceful heart. So actually desire peace. It's good. All right. What kinds of attitudes and practices should we avoid when we have disputes against one another in the church or among other Christians? What, should, what things should we avoid? Condescension. Condescension, right? Because uh, condescension kind of sounds like you fool, you moron, right? You know, because that is very condescending. Right? Yeah. We should avoid trying to prove someone wrong. Instead, we should focus on the truth. Yeah. Focus on the truth. Okay, well, right. And my favorite phrase is, but we've always done it this way. Okay. We've got a judging heart. Okay, a judging or a condemning heart, especially a condemning heart. Right? Uh, Jesus is going to talk more about that later. Right? A condemning heart. Yeah. Anger is contagious. It feeds on each other. in third person or playing telephone you, mm. you'll get information and it goes this way but when Jesus says it he clearly goes to the point okay. and he's going something's got money about. along the way Jesus brings clarity yeah not All right. like that. it's the same thing as the previous one right it, it's the crass deed right the crass deed versus the thought the heart the intent uh, both from God, God's will for us and His command, but also, you know, our intent, our hearts, right? That's what Jesus is getting at, right? Again, you know, there's that safety in that crash deed, right? You know, I have not done this. I mean, have you ever, hopefully you have never personally done this, but I tell you, one of the most frustrating things, you know, when you talk about proving righteousness, uh, one of the most, but one of the things I hate to hear the most. At least I haven't done blank like he has. 
you should really not talk to me about play. You really need to address this person over here who actually did play. <laughs> Throw them under the bus. Right? That is like the, the thing that I cannot stand the most. Um, that keeps me up at night. That gets my heart going. That gets my teeth, my teeth clenched. That's when I am thinking, moron, numb skull. <laughs> uh, you fool. Yeah. Right? Though that's the situation. That's it. So there's the contrast. Anything else about the contrast? Just if you ever have to manage people and have to hold them accountable, <laughs> yeah. that's the first thing you hear all the time. Oh, at so least I haven't done one yeah. or right. have you looked at this other person. Right. Now, the good news. <laughs> <coughs> mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, I, she gave it to me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And here's the point. It's always the end. Go back to his brother. <laughs> Go back to the fact that Jesus teaches us our Father who art in heaven. Amen. Go back to the fact that Jesus actually says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Or blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And hold on to that and love. Because when it comes to accountability, the accountability of our sins is on Christ. His body on the cross. Alright? You know, I, I mentioned this last week. This is not meant, I mean, it, it, it does help, right? You know, the, the law does provide a curb, you know, to curb crass wickedness in the world. The law does accuse us of our sin, right? But there's also, as members of God's kingdom, as forgiven children of God, there is a good guy here, okay? We don't have to prove our righteousness. Christ has proven it. But enjoy it. Live at a different standard because Christ has graciously brought you into it. Yes? The Lutheran understanding of the commandments isn't a list of don'ts. Yeah. It's not like, yeah, don't murder. But what does it mean to not murder? Well, it means to be helpful. Yeah. So instead of hurting someone, don't do that. There are other options on the other side. Right. All of all of what Jesus is going through in this part of this sermon is is that other side because yeah the law is pretty straightforward but but it's not one sided yeah there's a good side there's to the it. other side to it you can change every single commandment from thou shall not to thou shall because that, that's how the explanation in the catechism yeah. goes so when like when we're teaching the kids like don't call each other names it's not just that it's like how would you feel if he called you a name? Do you want to be treated that way? What would be a better option? Maybe be helpful. And how can you build up other people how, by your words? Right. Because right? that's again, that's how we serve God by serving others. So so in all in all of these pieces this part of the sermon, Jesus isn't telling them anything they don't know. He's just reminding them that, hey, yeah, great, you didn't kill anybody, cool, cool. But also, are you being helpful? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fear and love God says we do not blank, but blank. Yes. Uh, yeah. He doesn't have to and look except for the sixth, you shall not commit adultery. It actually does not give a list of all the things you shouldn't do, but it actually is all positive, right? It's we fear and love God so that we lead, we lead a sexually pure, decent life in what we say and do, and husband and wife love and honor each other. It's actually all positive. There are no negative things. Now, what do I spend a lot of time talking about? The negative things, right? But, I mean, we want to uphold what's good. And that's not, maybe not in this teaching of Jesus, but in other teachings of Jesus, when he brings up divorce uh, and lust, he actually speaks it from a very positive perspective. Yeah. So the scribes and the Pharisees over hundreds and hundreds of years had slippery slope the negatives into, let's break down this one big negative into a bunch of bunch of little negatives to like potholes to avoid, mm -hmm. you know, all the do nots. And yeah. as long as you avoid all those do nots, and it just became more and more and more. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it did. Like you said, raising that bar higher than they could achieve. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
All right, so I think we got these questions answered, so let's keep going. Augustine once said, there are three things which go to complete sin. The suggestion of, the taking pleasure in, and the consenting to. You know, is that there is kind of like a, a pattern of, you know, it's presented, we think about it, we, we, we yearn for it, and then we do it. Um, you know, and uh, just, uh, uh, you know, how is lust similar to murder or any other sin according to James 1? Uh, 14 minutes. So let's take a look at James 1. That's easy. James 1, verses 14 So how is lust similar to murder or any other sin, according to James chapter 1? They separate us from God. Hmm? They separate us from God. They do separate us from God. Mm. It brings death. Oh, yes. Right? Yeah. And, you know, um, there is a, a pattern there where, you know, like that desire, right, uh, does bring forth into earnest desire, which brings forth into actual actions uh, and, and continuing down the road. Right? Whereas Jesus is addressing... The very heart. Okay. Not just the crassest act, but the heart. All right. Pastor, does this all begin in the mind of our own mind? Well, yeah. I mean, Jesus says, out of the heart comes sexual morality. Uh, Mark, Mark chapter 7. Right. So, how do we address this? Verses 29 and 30. Uh, Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better to lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. And the biggest question uh, many people have asked is, is this a literal teaching? <laughs> Some people have said it is. Yeah. And there are people within... Christianity, uh, usually monks uh, who have actually done those very things. If a certain body part causes sin, they cut it off. Is that an acceptable or preferable way of fighting against sexual sin? No. no. Dismemberment is not. Right? Because it goes back to that crass act. Right? It's in your mind. It's, it's it in the heart. your mind from sinning. Yeah. Or your heart. Yeah. Um, here's some of the ways to explain this then. So yeah, Jesus is using various forms of figurative speech. Okay? One, hyperbole to teach seriousness. Right? He uses an extreme example to tell you that like, hey, this is serious stuff. Right? This is serious. Take it serious. Right? Uh, talking about dismemberment. Right? Plucking out eyeballs. Those kinds of things. Right? Metaphor for forms of temptation uh, into sexual sins, right? The hand and the eye. Right? You know, is that there are things that we do with our eyes, there are things that we do with our hands that do lead us into temptation, including breaking this command. Right? And so he's using that as a metaphor. Right? Uh, or a metaphor perhaps even for excommunicating members of the body. Um, Jesus will use, right, the body of Christ, the congregation, is that if someone is, uh, you know, in, in crass examples of sexual sin, um, you know, there was a time, you know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where even it was so crass within the body of Christ that even wicked pagan Corinth thought it was bad, you know, and they're all like, oh, you know, uh, you know, purge the leaven within you. Warn this person, right? And they did warn. They did take him out of the congregation, away from the sacrament of the altar as a kind of a, a, a matter of punishment or discipline. And uh, if you read between the lines of Second Corinthians, he was actually uh, told to be welcome back because he repented. So, great. 
Okay, so you know there is perhaps a metaphor for excommunicating members of the body, uh, but that one is not so thoroughly developed uh, in most biblical scholars than these first two. Uh, these first two are very solid and have great support. Okay, so uh, here's the point: take temptations into sexual sin seriously. Remove any possible forms of temptation within your own control. Right. Um, as do know that as members of God's kingdom, we're all in this together, right? We don't have to fight sin alone, right? We dare not fight sin alone, sexual sin or otherwise, right? Um, and see people as people, right? Not as objects for your own pleasure or gratification, right? Brothers and sisters. Right? So, yeah, I say that's uh, kind of the the teaching there. Any questions on this? Yeah. No question for a thought. Yeah. Um, it, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, you in chapter 5, it says the crowds follow him. Mm -hmm. It doesn't specifically say that the scribes and Pharisees were present, mm -hmm. but he was very, very well known at this point. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming there are some scribes and Pharisees. Because mm -hmm. as he's going through this, you have heard it said, I say to you, mm -hmm. I can just I can just feel the Pharisees and scribes starting to fume yeah. at this point. Or the people in the crowd turning to them and going, huh. Oh. And and is this the point at which the Pharisees really started getting under their skin and and starting to plot against him? Maybe maybe because not. he's adding to he's yeah. superseding their authority. Maybe, maybe not. Um, we could also think of it positively, like uh, Nicodemus was one of the Pharisees, right? He was a good guy. He was a good guy, and and so there might be. I think there were. I think there are some. And, and you know, in the Book of Acts, right? You have other priests and scribes who actually, you know, did you know follow the way, right? Who did follow Christ, uh, and, and so you know, hopefully, right? You know, you trust the Holy Spirit. Just, that might be the case, but also I think at the same time, there is the Holy Spirit working on their hearts and saying, oh yeah, oh yeah. Which would be, oh, yeah. there was a division. Them, right, and there is, right. Those who were listening and believing in the church, you were saying, you can't say. Yeah. Now, the big division among the Jews and scribes and Pharisees, that is highlighted in John, in, John, in the book of John. Book of Matthew is, don't worry about what other people think. What do you believe? What do you think? Who do you serve? Who do you follow? Who is your Lord and Savior? Enjoy. Okay? Don't worry about how other people think. Or don't think. What does God think? What does Jesus tell you? Right. I think that's good. All right, if there's any last kind of thoughts, questions, you know, that percolate from now to next week, we can bring it up, uh, and then we'll take it up uh, with the next topic, of course, on uh, verse 31, and continue um, through the rest of chapter 5, okay? So if there's anything else to address, I'll bring it up next week real quick, and then we'll get into uh, the next section. So uh, let's uh, stand for a little bit. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power, and then glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.